Those words sung by Jeremy Hall are the words written by one Martin Luther. A man who stood against a system that was a system counterfeiting the ministry of Christ. We think of Martin Luther and we think of the stained glass window or the artist's depiction of a man nailing a little note on the door. But when you go and stand there in the church in Worms and understand that he stood against councils, but more than councils, he stood against the principalities and powers of darkness. Though the heavens may fall, he stood for God and God alone. And the question we wrestle with today Will we stand? You know, it's easy to say that I'm going to stand someday. Oh, when it gets hard, I'll stand. But will we stand today? Are we willing today to be used by God? Are we willing today to live out the life that God has laid before us? I will tell you I'm very excited to be here with you this morning. I'm even more excited by the fact that, that a man who had a significant influence in my life is sitting in the congregation. It was 23 years ago that here in the Lansing Church, I was a part of a team that came for our field school of evangelism. And Dan Tower is here in the congregation, a man who was pastoring this church, and he, along with Robert Wagley and Steve Vail, had an extraordinary influence on my young student mind, understanding that the church exists for one reason and one reason alone, and that is to share and demonstrate the love of Christ to the community. was once interviewed for a church and the first question that was of a substantive nature that was asked of me was, what do you think about a church that doesn't want to do evangelism? You have to understand I was in the midst of preparing a series very similar to what we're talking about here in Michigan. We were reaching Illinois, the Chicagoland area, 10 million people, 34 live evangelistic series. I was pretty pumped up. And that question came, and it was one of those moments in life that you didn't process through it before you let it out. And when they asked me this question, what do you think about a church that doesn't want to do evangelism? I simply said, I wouldn't call it a church. I would call it a social club, to which the 150 people that had gathered for my interview let out an audible gasp. But we need to seriously consider, if we don't exist for sharing the hope and wholeness that there is in Jesus Christ, then why do we exist? We need to start asking the hard questions. If we lock the doors to our church and never returned again, would anybody in the community know any difference? We need to ask hard questions. The title of my message this morning... And don't worry, I know the clock, so I will say the title of my message this afternoon. Why Adventist? Why now? As I considered what I would preach and share over this weekend, I was led to this poignant topic. I believe that God has led in answering the, the appeal that I made of what to preach. You see, why Adventist? Why now? We live in a culture and a society that takes comfort in denominationalism. I am this. I am that. It, we're defined by our denominational preference. And there are some who would have us believe that the Seventh-day Adventist church is just another. Just another denomination. Some say that we're just merely one option amongst 
According to the World Christian Encyclopedia, 38,000 denominations. We're just one of the 38,000. In fact, in some corners of the Adventist church, there has been an attempt, a very strong attempt, to help us look sound and worship just like everybody else. The challenge is, is by doing so, we have relegated ourselves to irrelevance and insignificance. Is Adventism relevant today? Or should we just close up shop and go become Seventh-day Baptists? Today we're going to open the book of Daniel and Revelation and ask the question, why Adventist? Why now? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we study Your Word, I pray that You would speak through me today, that I would speak in clear tones. But I pray also, Lord, for all of those that are listening, both here in Lansing, but also those of you that are watching on the live live stream. I pray, dear God, that today wouldn't just be another Sabbath. But I pray today would be a moment in time where you did something different. You did something miraculous. And what happens from this day forward could only be attributed to you, dear God. Vindicate your name, Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open them to Daniel, the 12th chapter. Daniel, the 12th chapter, of course, is the last chapter of the book of Daniel. You know the story of Daniel, and you know it well. Right now, in my own personal devotions, I am studying through this time in which Jerusalem has collapsed. Three key prophets, there are many prophets, but three key prophets, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel, all contemporaries of one another. In 605 B.C., the Babylonians came to Jerusalem. The people of Jerusalem, the people of Judah, had been warned. Jeremiah said, hey, there's trouble coming from the north. That trouble is a lion and he's coming. Jeremiah had advised Jehoiakim, surrender. Just surrender. Jehoiakim, though, says, no, I'm king. I'm, I'm come from the line of David. I can't surrender. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. I'm the king. Ellen White, commenting on this reality, said that had Jehoiakim listened to the prophet, there would have been many conversions in the heathen nation of Babylon where there were none. You see, sometimes being obedient doesn't make sense. But we're not called to make sense out of God. We're called to be obedient. Because His thoughts are not our thoughts. And His ways are not our ways. And of course, you know, Daniel and many others were carried off into Babylon into which they were now going to try to make these Hebrew nobles into Babylonian subjects. That was the common practice of the day. Take the cream of the crop, Make them wholly, fully Babylonian and then place them over the people so that way at least it's one of their own that's ruling. You'll remember from Daniel chapter 1, the Bible says simply this phrase, Daniel purposed in his heart. Do we have purpose in our heart today? You see, Daniel understood his mission because he understood God. And the prophet Ezekiel, as you read through the book of Ezekiel, has a phrase that he uses over and over and over again. In the midst of all the disasters, in the midst of everything happening, in the midst of the three visits of Nebuchadnezzar to Jerusalem, eventually burning the city down to the ground, the Bible says over and over again that they might know I am the Lord. God has one mission, that everybody would know He is Lord. 
And that's why Daniel had a ministry in Babylon. We often lose sight. We often lose sight in the midst of talking about Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the division of Rome, what the whole purpose of that was. Daniel 1-4 through is the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar and how God went to the great lengths to reach even that heathen king. By the way, at the same time, and this is another sermon from another time, but at the same time, Zedekiah is having prophecies shared with him through the prophet Jeremiah. Zedekiah had all the privileges of the right knowledge, the right religion, the right place, the right temple. And he would not obey. And then you had this brutal heathen king who did not grow up in the right place, did not grow up with the right religion, didn't go to the right schools, didn't have any of the privileges that finally the Bible says he looked up to heaven and his senses returned. I am not the judge of men, but the Bible seems to be very clear. We will be able to sit down with Nebuchadnezzar on the sea of glass and talk to him about his journey. Zedekiah we won't be able to talk to. Daniel prophesies throughout the book of Daniel. And remember, why is prophecy even given? Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. I am the Lord and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. How do we know that? Because God knows the end from the beginning and the things that are not yet done. That's prophecy. Prophecy exists for one purpose, that people would come to know that God is God. And now as Daniel is landing the plane, so to speak, in his book in Daniel chapter 12, he's bringing it to a conclusion. We've had the last recapitulation or repeating and enlarging of the course of this earth's history in Daniel 10 through 11. And now Daniel 12 begins with the words, and it says, and at that time, Michael shall stand up. Those are good words to hear. Because that's when Jesus is going to bring it all to an end. But Daniel still has something on his mind. There was a prophecy given in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 13 that he still doesn't understand. Beginning in verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this river bank and the other on that river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and a half a time, and when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Although I heard, I did not understand. And then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. I want you to take note, there is a lesson within the lesson. Daniel is told to seal up the prophecy. Daniel wanted to understand. His desire was to understand. But Daniel, even though he didn't understand, and even though he wanted to understand, Daniel was obedient. And so he sealed up the book. Now let us be very clear. There are certain parts of Daniel that are very plain that didn't need to be sealed. Daniel chapter 2 is one of them. The angel clearly explained what that dream was. Daniel chapter 5 didn't need to be explained. Daniel chapter 7, these things are plain. But in specific, Daniel chapter 8 and into verse 9, Daniel didn't have complete understanding of the vision. In fact, Daniel 8.27 says that Daniel fainted and was sick for days, and afterward he arose and went about the king's business, and it says, I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. 
The word there, astonished, literally means to be desolate or to be appalled. Daniel didn't have an understanding of the vision, and while he was given a partial explanation in Daniel chapter 9, by the way, his praying for understanding of Daniel chapter 8 took place over the course of 13 years before God actually answered in Daniel chapter 9. You see, we go from Daniel 8 to 9 in as quick as it takes us to just go like this. One page. Daniel waited 13 years between those pages. Yet Daniel was faithful throughout, and yet he still wasn't given a full understanding other than Daniel was praying about 70 years of captivity, and God says, listen, I'm going to bring that captivity to an end, but i got better news for you. I'm going to bring the captivity of sin to an end. Daniel did not understand, and Daniel was told to seal up the book, and the Bible says that he was to seal up the book until the time of the end. Now, we don't need to wonder when the time of the end is. The Bible clearly tells us when the time of the end will be. The time of the end will take place at the end of a time, times, and a half a time. Now, I'm going to be going through these things rather quickly. And if you happen to be new or unfamiliar with these prophecies and you would like more information, this congregation is full of pastors that I'm sure would be very happy to study with you. Pastor Tower will be happy to study with you. I'm volunteering you, Pastor. Pastor Chad would be happy to share with you. Pastor Justin, happy to share with you. Pastor Wes, happy to share with you. But then you have your own pastors here, Pastor Phil and Pastor Jericho, who will be happy to share with you. And if you want to catch me in the back, I'd be happy to share with you. What is a time, times, and a half a time? According to the Bible, a time is 360 days, one Jewish year. Times is two years, and a half a time is a half a year. You add that all together, and it's 1,260. 60 days. According to the Bible, in prophetic time, a day equals a year. 1,260 years. At the end of that 1,260 years, then will come the time of the end. But that's an answer for us. When is the time of the end? Now, I'm sure Daniel was disappointed because he wanted to know the message, but yet in faith, he allowed Jesus to lead and was obedient and placed his faith and trust in him and sealed up the book. When is the time of the end? You can keep your finger in Daniel chapter 12 and let's go to Revelation chapter 10. There in Revelation chapter 10, 600 years after Daniel sealed up his book, we join the Apostle John sitting on the island of Patmos. An aged old man who had been banished to an island because he too was willing to take a stand. John lived at a time in Rome's history where there was something new that happened. The emperor Domitian came to power and he did something that no other emperor had ever done. You see, all emperors prior to, when they would die, they would be what was called deified. They would build altars to them and they would worship the dead emperors. Domitian did something new. He claimed his authority as a god while he was still living. The Romans came to Ephesus and demanded worship of Domitian. John took a stand and he would not worship. He would not cast the salt before the altar. And so first, what did they do to the Apostle John? They tried to kill him by poisoning him. And he drank the poison and he did not die. And then not being satisfied with this, the Romans said, well, then we'll boil you in oil. I don't know if you've ever had this experience in your life, but I think it should be a requirement for life in general, and that is to work in fast food. Because if you can deal with people and how upset they get about something as simple as food, you can deal with anything. Why am I illustrating and talking about fast food? Well, because if you work around a fryer, you understand that the perfect temperature to fry French fries is 335 degrees Fahrenheit. That is not the perfect temperature to place that oil upon any part of your body. But if you start raising the temperature above 335, 
The oil begins reaching its smoke point where the oil begins to oxidize and smoke is coming off of that oil. Now it's really, really hot. But then as it moves beyond that point, you can actually boil oil. And when you boil oil, something happens. As that oil is boiling, as it evaporates, it ignites on its evaporation. And that is then now you have fire on top of your oil. This is how kitchen fires start, by the way. So when the Apostle John would not die after he drank poison, he said, we'll boil him in oil. So I want you to picture there in Ephesus a cauldron filled with oil that has a flame over the top of it. And they take the Apostle John and they cast him into the cauldron of oil. And he did not die. So what do you do? You let him live, but you're going to put him on a prison colony of Patmos. If you happen to travel to Turkey any day, it is about a three and a half hour boat ride up through the Aegean Sea, and it literally is a rock nine miles long that has risen out of the water. Now there's resorts there and things like that. But for the Apostle John, there was nothing there, and so in the midst of loneliness, in the midst of being by himself. He was the last living of the original disciples. All the rest had been martyred. In the midst of a grand disappointment, an angel visitor comes and says, John, I want to unfold something to you. And now here in Revelation chapter 10, we are in the interlude between the sixth and seventh trumpet. The seven trumpets is the third in a series of sevens. Seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets. The seven churches are the spiritual condition of the church throughout time. The seven seals are God's judgment upon the church throughout time. And the seven trumpets are Satan's attack on the church throughout time. Here in this interlude, God gives to John a message that is a message filled with hope, and hopefully it is filled with hope for you today. Beginning in verse 1, I saw still another angel, another mighty angel, coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I was, excuse me, I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. Your mind should be reflecting back on something we just read because we are seeing a scene that is almost identical to the scene In Daniel chapter 12, same figure, same place. Daniel's told to seal up the book till the time of the end. John is told that there will be delay no longer. Verse 7, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, and as he declared to his servants the prophets. I want you to notice the location of the angel, right hand to heaven, swearing, and then the Bible says there will be delay no longer. You see, in Daniel, the angel was in a similar location. His hand was up to heaven, except he speaks of the time of the end and says it will be after the 1260 days or 1260 year prophecy. What's going on here? What does it mean that the angel says to John, there shall be delay no longer? And if you're feeling confused, just stick with me because it'll make sense. The word delay is the Greek word chronos from where we get our English word chronology. Literally translated, it is consecutive time or run its course. What is the angel telling John? 
The angel is telling John the time prophecies of Daniel have reached their conclusion and they have run their course. And the concern of the angel is the timing of the opening of the little book. Do we have anywhere in the Bible where a book is sealed? We we just read that in Daniel chapter 12. Same figure, same location. And the angel in Daniel 12 talked about a specific time. The angel in Daniel, excuse me, in Revelation 10 spoke of a specific time. What are we getting at here? Sometime after the conclusion of the 1260 day prophecy, the little book, which is representative of the sealed prophecies of Daniel, would be unsealed. Do we have any time in this earth's history where we know this has been fulfilled? We do. The 1260-day prophecy, which is the significant prophecy which describes the dark days of this earth's history, the Dark Ages, began in 538 with the Emperor Justinian handing over the reins of the empire to the Roman Catholic Church. And you add 1260 to 538 and you end up in 1798. Anything significant happened in 1798? Yes, in 1798, Berthier is sent by Napoleon to deal with an uprising in Rome and the killing of his brother-in-law. Berthier ends up in Rome and there on Palatine Hill takes the Pope captive and brings to an end the reign of the papacy. I would encourage you, if you've never done so, to go on a Reformation tour with Dr. Gerard Domsty. If you can't get on his tour in 2022, I'll be doing the tour through the Hope Channel. Because you end the tour in Paris. Why in Paris? Because there is the tomb of Napoleon. There the tomb of Napoleon. There is a statue And the architect who designed the statue without knowing it outlined the fulfillment of prophecy because there Napoleon stands. And in his one hand, the Codex Justinianus, the Code of Justinian making the Pope supreme over the empire. And in his left hand, the Codex Napoleonis, which removed the power from the papacy. 538 to 1798. 1798 begins the time frame as the Bible outlines of the time of the end. This 1260 day prophecy, by the way, occurs in Daniel 7, Revelation 11, Revelation 12, and Revelation 13. You think that God's trying to draw our attention to something. And so now the angel, speaking to John, leads him through what the experience would be like in the rise of a special movement of destiny for God's people. And so now John is instructed, and John will reenact the experience of the time of the end when the book of Daniel will be unsealed. Revelation 10, verse 8, Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and I said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. And then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. The word there, sweet, is the Greek word gluku, from where we get our English word glucose. Have you ever had sugar on your tongue before? Have you ever had that spoon that you put in the honey and then put it in your mouth? I know. You can say it. It's okay. But then it says it will be bitter in the stomach, which literally translated is undrinkable, sour. But it figuratively is used in the New Testament to describe someone who has become embittered or resentful.
Have you ever had that experience before? As John now is reenacting the experience of the opening of the little book? Have you ever had a moment in time in your life where you were eating something and it was, oh, so delicious? But unfortunately, you were not allowing your physical body to control you, but your mind and your mouth to control you, and you continued to eat and partake of whatever this delicious item was. And you eat and you eat and you eat some more. And oh, how wonderful it is in your mouth. Just delicious. Maybe it's that cake. And you say, I'm going to have a second piece because I can. And then about 30 minutes later, your stomach, hey, that was a really bad idea. And your stomach begins doing things and making noises and making you feel not so special. And we say, why did I eat that second piece? John and Vision is reenacting this experience that sometime after 1798, as the book of Daniel is opened, as the book of Daniel would be opened, there would be an experience that was sweet as honey in the mouth, but bitter in the stomach. Sometime after 1798, history tells us that the late 18th century and the early 19th century had some very interesting times within the church context. Most Christians at the time were what we would call post-millennial. What does that mean? Most churches were teaching the idea that through the ingenuity of man, the earth was becoming better and better and better. And finally, after we had reached this utopian state of being, God would come and reign supreme for the thousand-year millennium. The problem is, as society began looking out and realizing the earth's not getting better and better, it's getting worse and worse, people began wondering. And it was at that time that people like Johann Petri in Germany began studying the book of Daniel and began preaching. This earth isn't getting better and better. This earth is getting worse and worse. And there's only one solution to this problem. And that's the second coming of Jesus Christ. And they began preaching that not only is that the solution, but the book of Daniel outlines when Jesus is going to come. And so while this is happening in Germany, John Aquila Brown in England is doing the same thing. And while that's happening in England, William Cummings Davis is preaching in Scotland the same thing. And at the same time, Joseph Wolfe, a Jewish Christian, is traveling the world preaching the same message. Edward Irving in Scotland and England is preaching the same thing. William Digby in England is preaching the same thing. Children are preaching in Norway that Jesus is coming soon sometime around 1843 or 1844. All the while, William Miller, a Baptist preacher here in the northeastern United States, was preaching the same message. Hiram Edson writes these wor- wrote these words describing the experience of the Advent movement and the opening of the book of Daniel, I mused in my heart saying, my Advent experience has been the brightest of all my Christian experiences. You see, people were now waiting in anxious anticipation, believing that Jesus was going to come in 1843 or 1844. And before we get caught up in the reality saying, how could they do that? Jesus said, no one knows the time or the hour. They explain that text away by simply saying, Jesus didn't know at that time, but now Jesus has revealed it to us. You see, in the innocence of their faith, they were actually fulfilling the prophecy of Revelation 10. A sweet as honey in the mouth experience. And I want you to think about that. Think about what it would mean to you if you knew exactly when Jesus was coming. (laughs) 
What can we compare it to? I'm going to go see my mom tomorrow. And I'm excited because I haven't seen my mom in a while. I'm anxiously anticipating, preparing for that visit. What would it mean if we knew exactly when Jesus was going to come? And now I understand God doesn't tell us when Jesus is going to come because many of us have a problem. And that problem is called procrastination. And we put off getting ready until right before He came. But the point is, is if you knew that, how excited would you be? But what do you know? No man knows the time or the hour, but the Bible says clearly Jesus is coming soon. Why are we not getting ready today? October the 22nd, 1844, those of you who know history, was a monumental day because there are a group of people that believe that that was the day that Jesus was going to come. Come with me back in time, some 177 years. By the way, that is a very sad testimony that we've been here 177 years longer than we needed to be. Come with me back to that day. Undoubtedly, they gathered. They gathered likely before sunrise. Because, of course, Jesus is going to come at the breaking of the day. I imagine in our mind they were singing those old Advent hymns. You will see the Lord a-coming. Watch ye saints. And they were singing it with power. Maybe by midday, the power began to wane a little bit. Until someone from the crowd said, wait, no, Jesus is coming at midnight. And they had that strength to go the second part of the day. I want you to imagine with me, you were there on that day waiting. And 10 p.m. came. And then 11 p.m. came. And then 11.30 came. And 11.45 came. And at 11.50, maybe the hope was beginning to fade. I want you to imagine being there when the toll of midnight came. And they waited five more minutes. Maybe their clock wasn't adjusted, right? And Jesus didn't. Hiram Edson wrote these words describing the experience. Our expectations were raised high, and thus we looked for our coming Lord until the clock tolled twelve at midnight. The day had then passed, and our disappointment had become a certainty. Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted And such a spirit of weeping came over us as I have never experienced before. It seemed to me that the loss of all earthly friends could have been no comparison. We wept and wept until the day dawned. Has the Bible proved a failure? Is there no God in heaven, no golden city, no paradise? Is all this but a cunningly devised fable? Is there no reality to our fondest hopes and expectations? Henry Emmons wrote these words, I waited all day Tuesday, October the 22nd, 22nd, and dear Jesus did not come. I waited all the forenoon of Wednesday and was well in body as I ever was. But after 12 o'clock, I began to feel faint. And before dark, I needed someone to help me up to my chamber as my natural strength was leaving me very fast. And I lay prostrate for two days without any pain, sick, with disappointment. And some may be wondering why at the launch of Reach Michigan 
would I address this topic and speak on this issue? Because the rise of God's remnant people in fulfillment of prophecy is exactly what a 21st century society needs. Are you disappointed? Have you been disappointed? Do you find yourself discouraged, maybe with grief? All you need to do is read the news. Society feels that way. Friends, society all around us is collapsing in disbelief. There is desperation in our society today. There is disappointment. There is concern over the unknown. And God's last day remnant movement has been called for such a time as this. Because it is the answer. Because out of disappointment, God has a divine appointment for every man, woman, and child. Something to bring them out of these desperate times. But the question that I ask this morning, this afternoon, in all humility is, why are we silent in a time in which our voice should be heard? Verse 11 of Revelation 10, going into chapter 11. By the way, we need to understand, when John wrote the book of Revelation, there was no chapter and verse division. That's how they would have read it. And out of the bitter disappointment, what did he say? And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. What was he to prophesy? And then... I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. You see, my dear friends, God gives us the answer to the problems of our day. The answer to our problems is not Joe Biden or Donald Trump. The answer to our problems, if you're living in another country, is not a new religious leader, not a new Congress, not a new parliament. The answer to our day is simple. It is found in the sanctuary. Why is it found in the sanctuary? Why is there a means to measure and judge and examine the sanctuary? Because Psalm 77.13 says, Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Psalm 73 says, When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood the end. Psalm 63, So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. And don't miss this. The very foundational core of the belief of the Seventh-day Adventist church, a movement of destiny called prophetically by God, is found in the sanctuary. If you remove the sanctuary from our message, There is nothing distinct about us. There are many churches that worship on Sabbath. There are many churches that believe the state of the dead. There are many churches that believe the same thing about hell. There are other churches that teach the health message. But the rise of the prophetic movement of destiny in Revelation 10 is founded principally on the reality that the sanctuary is the blueprint It is the puzzle piece that puts it all together. You see, the sanctuary ties it all together. The showbread teaches us that man shall not live by bread alone. The lamps teach us that we cannot live unless we are fueled by the Holy Spirit. The altar of incense says we will not live unless we pray and talk to God. 
And the mercy seat teaches us about the, important of, the importance of judgment and the law of God. And there in the Ark of the Covenant, Aaron's rod teaches us the importance of proper administration and leadership in the church. The manna teaches us that we must depend fully upon God. The priesthood teaches us about the priesthood above all, excuse me, the priesthood of all believers. But above all else, why is the sanctuary key? Why is the answer to life's bitterest disappointments found in the sanctuary as outlined to the Apostle John. Because, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2 tells us why the sanctuary is so important. Now, this is the main point of the things we are seeing, saying we have such a high priest who is seated, seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. The answer is simple, but we make it so complicated. The answer is the presence of Jesus solves everything. Why Adventists? Why now? What is the relevance of the remnant movement in the 21st century? You see, Jesus must be active in our lives because we spend time with Him in the sanctuary. You see, the mainstream evangelical message is simply this. Jesus came, Jesus died. And that's it. And because He died to save you from your sins, you can do whatever you want. And when Jesus comes again, hopefully you'll be taken to heaven. But if you're not taken to heaven, don't worry. There's a second opportunity to get it right. No, the message of the fulfillment of Revelation 10 places Jesus actively involved in each and every person's life because Jesus, yes, did come and live a life that we should live. He died the death we should deserve, but He rose again. And in His rising again, He conquered the grave. And while the cross is, yes, an important figure in Christianity, I would, con I, would, I would offer to you that the more important symbol is the more important symbol is an empty tomb. Jesus' death on a cross without an empty tomb doesn't do anything for us. And by the way, let it be known that it is no coincidence in the 21st century that we are having the rise of an apostate teaching and belief that teaches that Jesus is a created being and no different than any of the rest of us. Eternal life and salvation can only be done by one who is fully God and fully man. The one who John 3.16 refers to as, yes, the only begotten, but it's one of the most poorly translated phrases in the Bible. Literally, it says he was monogenes, the one and only unique one, because he was fully God and fully man at the same time. And people say, I don't know what that means. That's why it's called the mystery of God. And I will tell you this. We get so caught up trying to figure out, and you know, there are a lot of discussions in the church. We are so arrogant sometimes where we say, oh, I know what the nature of Christ was. Really? I, I'm interested to know. Because the Bible calls him the one and only unique one. How have you figured it out? Why does Ellen White say we will study the science of salvation throughout eternity? Because we still have a lot to learn. You see, Jesus was enough like us that He could save us. But He was enough not like us so He could save us. And I want to urge you, caution, don't be listening to these ideas that Jesus was simply just another created being. Because if Jesus was merely just another created being, then we are in a whole lot of trouble. The message of hope for our day is that Jesus is alive. That He is actively involved in our lives daily in the sanctuary. Jesus said in John 12, 32, If I am lifted up on the earth, I will draw all peoples to Myself. Jesus is alive in the sanctuary. And that, my friends, is the good news. The answer to today's problems and challenges are clearly articulated by Jesus. In the midst of signs in the midst of wars and rumors of war, in the midst of nations rising against nations, in the midst of pestilences, and yes, in the midst of famines and pandemics. 
Jesus gave the answer. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the, wor- in the world, in all the world, as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Paul warned in Galatians that there will be some coming with a false gospel and false Christs. They are called Gnostics, secret knowledge. And it's amazing in the 21st century, we have the rise of Adventist Gnostics. Did you know that? Every conspiracy theory ever known to man is the answer to our problems. I'm going to tell you this, friends, and I, you know, and I mean, and I'm sorry, if I offend you, I, I, I apologize that I've offended you, but I'm not apologizing for the message. There is not one person I've ever met who has been saved by a knowledge of who really sank the Titanic and what the Illuminati and what the Masons are doing today. Not one. By the way, if you think you got it all figured out, you better run for the hills because these organizations have been known in the past to make sure that people are silent. Just in case you think you've got it all figured out. There's only one thing we need to figure out, and that is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. What difference do we make in people's lives? John 3.16 is simple. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever... How many people? Whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But then we leave out the next part. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. How often do we stand in judgment of our communities and thus by standing in judgment of our communities we disenfranchise our communities and we make no difference. Jesus came to save. The word there is the Greek word sozo. Literally translated, deliverance from sin. But also translated elsewhere to be made well, or to be made whole, or to be healed. Jesus came with one purpose. To bring hope and healing and restoration. Physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, intellectually, and most certainly, Spiritually. That is evidenced not through a theoretical discussion on what would Jesus do, but through the reality of what Jesus did do. John chapter 2, and I talked about this last night. Where did Jesus show up in John chapter 2? First miracle. Where did He show up? At a wedding in Cana. These people were about to be socially embarrassed because they were going to run out of beverage. And Jesus turned the water into unfermented wine and saved these people from social embarrassment. John chapter 3, where's Jesus? He's in an interview with Nicodemus. The Bible says that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. When you get into Greek and you like these kind of grammar things, the syntax is that Nicodemus came in a nighttime-ish sort of way. He came under the cover of darkness. Why? Because he wasn't yet ready for the public to know that he possibly believed that this man was the Messiah. Interestingly enough, Jesus never outs him. Nicodemus doesn't show up until the end of the book of John. Because Jesus wants to minister to people who are intellectuals. Where does Jesus show up in John chapter 4? The Bible says that he had to go through Samaria. He didn't have to. The rest of the people of Judah, they didn't go through Samaria. The Jews didn't like the Samaritans. They were their cousins, but they were filthy dogs according to the Jews. They wouldn't even step foot on the ground. That's how filthy they thought they were. But Jesus needed to go. Because there was a woman there collecting water at noon. You don't collect water at noon. You collect water in the morning. Why was she collecting water at noon? Because everybody in town knew that she had been married five times. You ever had somebody gossip to you? You see, the watering well, the, the well was a social gathering where we'd get the news of the day. This woman had grown tired of as she would crest the hill coming to the well of the whispers. She's coming. Don't say anything more. Have you ever walked in in a conversation like that, by the way? 
where somebody's talking about you and you know they're talking about you, but they stopped just in time so you didn't hear what they said? That's what happened to this woman day in and day out. So finally she says, I'm going to go out of water at noon. A woman who had been scarred emotionally, scarred physically, and now living with a man who wasn't her husband, most likely in some type of an abusive situation. And there at the well, Jesus says, you can gather as much water out of this well as you want. You will be thirsty. But if you drink from this well, you will never thirst again. How many people are in Lansing that are thirsting? John chapter 5, Jesus shows up at the pool of Bethesda. To a man who has been physically handicapped his entire life. And Jesus provides physical healing. John chapter 6, Jesus feeds a hungry crowd of 5,000 so he might reach their souls. John chapter 7, he ministers to his brothers and to the religious leaders. And then in John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery is cast before Jesus. Ellen White comments that the way they were able to catch her in adultery is by committing adultery with them, by committing adultery with her. They set her up and they cast the woman before Jesus and says, said, the law of Moses demands that she be stoned. And Jesus makes one very simple comment. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he crouches down and he begins writing. The Bible doesn't tell us what he was writing, but whatever he was writing attracted enough attention from the religious leaders that they didn't want to be around when he finished what they wrote. And so they start leaving, one by one, until they're all gone. And then Jesus asked the woman a question after they had all departed. Woman, where are your accusers? And we often, often say, they were gone. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Jesus could have cast the first stone. But aren't you grateful that the Bible describes Jesus not as the accuser of the brethren, but the advocate of the saints? Why Adventists, why now? We live in a bruised and battered society that is looking for answers. And I'm afraid we have reached a position where we're missing the point that maybe God is trying to make. I think we've missed the point of COVID-19. And let me be very clear, I'm not making a political statement in what I'm about to say. But I think we've missed the point. Yeah, COVID-19 is just another in the series of fulfillments of signs of the time. But we've missed the point. In the midst of a pandemic, who shall we depend on? We have churches around the world now that there are many people that are just simply not going to return. Because they've simply gotten out of the habit or because there was no fellowship, and so what's the benefit of going to church anyways? And unfortunately, many of us have taken a position similar to that of Nebuchadnezzar, who stood and said, look at great Babylon that I have built. And we think the answer to this problem, and by the way, let me be very clear, Brazil are finding out that it's not. 
There's only one thing that will fix this, my dear friends, and one thing alone. And that is the day where somewhere in the east we will see a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And the trumpet will sound and the voice of God will be heard. It is only then that this will all be brought to an end because it's COVID-19 today. Metropolitan area of Detroit, there are 5.5 million people. In the metropolitan area of Grand Rapids, there are a million people. And many of them are going to a grave, doomed, bitter, and disappointed. And often it's because we have been unwilling to be willing to do what God has called us to do. You see, William Miller, in the midst of his disappointment, said this, Brethren, hold fast. Let no man take your crown. I have fixed my mind on another time, and here I mean to stand until God gives me more light. And that is, today, 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 until He comes again. And so Pastor Peppers ended our little time here together asking, What's next? I hope what's next is not for you to wait until September. In fact, I hope when you answer the question, what's next, it's not even I'll wait till tomorrow. I hope when you ask the question, what's next, God is speaking to you about something this afternoon. Maybe there's someone you need to call and the Lord's laying it on your heart right now to speak to them a word of hope. Maybe, just maybe, there's somebody you need to go and visit. Maybe God has placed it upon your heart to make a meal for someone. Maybe the Lord's placed it upon your heart to invite a family over to your home. I don't know what it is. And maybe it's something as basic as you've got something against somebody in this church. And God's laying it on your heart to go and speak to them. And I don't want to take this too deep, but maybe you've got something against somebody who doesn't go to church anymore here because of you. And you need to make things right with them. God changed the world with 11 men who were imperfect. Today I hope we ask the question, what God can you do with me? Jeremy is going to sing a song here before we close. While he's singing, you're going to receive a card. And I want to encourage you, don't just take this card and slip it in your Bible. I want you to take this card and read through it. But in particular, on the back side, there are five blanks. I can tell you one thing that God can do with you, no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter how many friends you have or don't have, we can pray. Would you be willing to write five names on this card and then put this card on your refrigerator, put it in your notebook, wherever, that you're continually reminded? Are you willing to pray for five people asking God to intervene in their life and do something special? And are you willing to put one of those names on that list as your name? Simply asking God, what can you do with me? Jeremy is going to sing the song, What You Could Do With Me. God wants to do something in Michigan that's never been done before. And the question I'd like for us to wrestle with today is, will we be a willing vessel for him to work in us than to work through us. You don't have to be the strongest because God's perfect in your weakness. If God can move a mountain with a faith like a grain of a mustard seed, it begs us to ask the question, I wonder what you could do with me. Open my eyes. Show me who I could be.
God wants to do something special here. God doesn't want us to keep celebrating anniversaries of the great disappointment. God wants to celebrate with us at the marriage supper of the Lamb. What's God calling us to do? Today, if you'd like to answer the call, say, Lord, I want to be willing to be willing to do whatever you ask. And I invite you to stand. And our closing hymn is number 511, and we're just going to sing the first and last verse. I know whom I've believed. Because, friends, this isn't about you, and it's not about me. Revival is not born through the executive action of the conference executive committee nor the action of a church board. Revival happens beginning in my own heart. Are we willing to be willing? Because He is more powerful than any one of us or any collective of us. Let's sing together about the one we've believed in. As we close in prayer, this afternoon at 3.30, I'll be holding a training that will be live streamed from the Detroit Metro Church. You can find that stream at mizda.org. In addition to that, there is a training here, so you have options. And then at 6 p.m., we'll be live streaming another rally, and I will be preaching a different message. But may we be committed to God and committed to reaching Michigan with the gospel message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have come here today in hopes that you would not leave us the same. And so now as we depart, I pray that all of us would be different. Lord, if you could use a small stone to kill a giant and a staff to part a sea, most certainly you can use all of these individuals and me. And so, Lord, I pray that you would work in us in a mighty way and that you would work through us. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.